we have bigger errors involved, um, just due to things like the shapes of coccolis, uh, the, the backscattering cross-section that I talked to you about. Um, so our errors are, are compounded by things like this. How, we, how do we convert coccolith concentration to PIC? Um, now the three-band algorithm, those are the three bands. And, and out here, we basically assume that the absorption is mainly due to water, that term there, which we know. And then we measure the reflectance. We use the published values of uh, water absorption to estimate what the BB should be. <coughs> Excuse me. And then we assume this relationship here for uh, a wavelength dependence, which goes back to the Voss paper. Um, and in this case, we're using a 1.35 factor. And, and these assumptions allow us to figure out the backscattering at, at other wavelengths. This algorithm works really well in turbid water, so the densest blooms, we get better uh, measurements here. B working in the red, we don't have complications from absorption by CDOM, uh, a dissolved organic matter. So as an example here, here's the two-band algorithm for the same feature in the three-band algorithm. And you can see in, in this, uh, in, this is off of the Western European shelf, and this feature right here was saturated in the two-band, but the three-band, uh, there's no saturation. So, um, okay, how well does the algorithm work? Uh, this is... Uh, this is actually data from uh, Jason here, uh, who you should talk to if you want to learn lots of things about phenology, and we'll, we'll I'll just touch on this at the end. Um, here are field estimates of calci calcite based on acid labile scattering, and this is aqua, modus aqua estimates of PIC. And um, essentially, and this is, uh, this is log log, um, and the higher the concentration, so the one-to-one -one line is the dashed line, um, and we have this cutoff here related to the op how well we can measure the, uh, with the optical technique. But essentially, as you get to lower calcium carbonate concentrations, scattering of other stuff makes these error limits go up. And as we go to higher concentrations, these, the, the, the errors converge and we can make uh, more accurate estimates. But, you know, it does, it's not bad. It is a case one algorithm. So uh, you guys have talked about case one versus case two. Yeah, I'm looking to Emmanuel. And, yeah. So if there are sediments in the water, if there's CDOM in the water, um, uh, all bets are off of how well, if there's glacial flour in the water, um, it will fool this algorithm. It's a scattering-based algorithm. And so, you know, I, I, if I could tell you the number of emails I've gotten from people around the Baltic that say, oh, geez, you know, the, your PIC algorithm doesn't work in the Baltic. Well, there's all this CDOM and stuff coming in. Um, there are people that have been off the coast of Antarctica where there's, you can imagine, a lot of glacial flour coming in. And down there, it's... Uh, 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 it, it doesn't work that well. Um, so with these global views, uh, there are a couple of caveats. Algorithm can be fooled by other scattering materials. Expected standard error for marine satellite derived BB. For uh, and this is a number we published. There's nothing magical about it. We just went in and, and looked at the comparisons. Um, uh, that is the error for a one pixel estimate of PIC. And we can reduce that by measuring more pixels and taking an average. But, you know, that, that's kind of what we have to work with. And that's not a, that's not a, t you, you wouldn't necessarily see that with a naked eye, but it's, it's getting there. So the way we get around this is to sample uh, over space and time. There's that number right there, the spatial resolution in kilometers. And here's the time bins. We can sample over time and come up with averages to reduce those standard errors. There's the 14.9 micrograms PIC per liter. If we go to a 30-day average uh, with a 36-kilometer resolution, we can drop that down to a standard error, which is 
representative of our uh, ability to measure it in the environment. So we still need some higher PIC concentrations. And so uh, we came up with this harebrained idea to do chalk X, uh, where blooms are relatively rare events. And, and we'd say, oh, yeah, we want to go study this bloom in the Gulf of Maine. And then they, they, we don't have any blooms in the Gulf of Maine for a decade. And so uh, we thought it, it, uh, we'd, we'd do a, make a do-it-yourself coccolithophore bloom. And this is, it was really fun. And uh, the other thing that we were going to do was to look at the fate of this material since we could figure out the production exactly. We knew how much PIC we were putting in to the system. Then we could figure out how quickly it was disappearing and what processes were involved. It doesn't take much coccolith chalk to make a patch visible from space. That's 13 tons. Uh, and you could time deployments to clear sky overpasses to get over the problem of scheduling ships around rare bloom events. And uh, we did have to deal with the EPA and the Coast Guard, however. Uh, and, and, but when we told them that a quarter of all the marine sediments on Earth are chalk, um, uh, and we did the de deployments in regions of known coccolithophore blooms, uh, we were able to allay their fears. So uh, chalk concentration is highly correlated to its scattering. So here is, this is this material um, that we bought. Uh, it was from the United Kingdom. It was from the White Cliffs of Dover, uh, which is nothing but Cretaceous coccolith chalk. Um, and this, this is the, the optical regression versus the backscattering per, uh, 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 against the 532 nanometer backscattering. And you can see it's highly uniform. It's easily calibrated. And so this is, this, as opposed to the field situation where you've got all these different shaped coccolis, this actually gave us a real leg up. And the size distribution of this stuff, um, uh, basically it was passed through sieves. And the average particle size was about 2 microns, uh, so about the size of a coccolith. <coughs> so that's us. Uh, getting ready to go. Uh, uh, this is the research vessel Endeavor. And, and uh, these are bags of a meter cubed quantities of uh, Cretaceous coccolith chalk. Uh, U.S. Customs and Immigration was in this building over here. And this is just after the uh, anthrax where someone had been measuring, uh, uh, been mailing envelopes of little uh, you know, white powder to people to try to knock them off. And we were showing up on their docks with these uh, bags, uh, meter cube bags of, of white powder. And we raised a lot of eyebrows and uh, we told them that it was cake mix for the uh, uh, chef on board. Uh, <laughs> 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 yeah. So, so here we were. We, um, we would mix this stuff in a tub on deck. Uh, and then we would circulate it with mine dewatering pumps to break up the clods. And then we would circulate, once we had it all suspended, we would circulate it into what we called a spreader on the stern, which had small quarter inch holes all the way across. And we distribute it uh, basically uniformly. And then the ship would steam in a circle. I don't think I could do this experiment now. Uh, this is what it looked like when we were done, which looked just like a coccolithophore bloom. Uh, notice the nice clear skies. And we had optical uh, uh, measurements, backscattering measurements, set up on undulating, uh, toad undulating sensors so that we could follow what happened, the fate of this material as, as it disseminated. We had sediment traps to look to see how much was vertically falling, how much was consumed by grazers, and how much was advected and, and uh, 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 subducted. And so we had optical sensors on the bow, optical sensors up above. And, and here was the, the, uh, the sea whiffs image here, and, or modus, I'm sorry. And that was the, that was the patch. Um, but we could do more than that. And we were looking really to see what was the fate. And uh, the ship's track is shown here. Oh, that's it. Um, and essentially, we found most of this material was subducted 
through submesa scale size features. It was basically uh, we created about a 10 kilometer, uh, one meter thick thin layer with inanimate calcite particles that were basically drawn out and subducted uh, into a very thin layer that that went out about 10 kilometers. Did you, did you catch them in seven Very few. And what was the, it was, it was unfortunate because one of the cool things about this was the, the um, mass, uh, the, the stable isotope signature of this was so far off from anything that was in, in the seawater that we had a great way to find it. And, uh, but very little fell into the traps two micron particles that sink, I, I haven't mentioned this so far, coccoliths sink at a tenth of a meter per day, two micron coccolith. Cells will sink faster, but the, the coccoliths sink very slowly. So take a coccolith in the top of the Atlantic Ocean and let it sink over four kilometers, figure out how many days it takes for that coccolith to make it to the sea floor, how many years it takes for that coccolith to make it to the sea floor. It's, a lot of people don't think on those time scales, but in fact, it, they sink very slowly. So uh, perhaps it's not a surprise. We, we were hoping, you know, we thought we might see them in fecal pellets being dropped into the trap, but it was pretty much a physical uh, explanation. So these are the Atlantic Meridional Transect cruises that we've done, nine all told. Uh, and, and these go from 50 south, or 45 south to 45 north. And look at the ratio, I'm just plotting here, the ratio of PIC to chlorophyll along these tracks. It's a log scale, and you see in the middle of the gyres, that ratio goes up to about 60. And in the equatorial upwelling regions, that ratio is about 3. So there's this huge variability in terms of optically active materials. There is a lot relatively, uh, the, the, the influence of calcite is important in the gyres and not so important uh, in the more productive regions. And that BB prime factor that I was telling you that we measure along track, if you normalize that to the total backscattering, so this goes from zero to one. Uh, in the gyres, that number is, there it is, the gyre, South Atlantic gyre, uh, central gyre, uh, and the North Atlantic central gyre, it's 25 to 50% of that scattered light is associated with acid labile backscattering or calcite uh, scattering. And, and in the South, it, that's the North Atlantic gyre right there, and that's the South Atlantic gyre. So, so really in the gyres, even though the concentration of PIC is low, uh, there it is uh, very optically active and, has a, and contributes to the radiance. Um, here's a section of coccolithophore cells and aggregates from uh, 45 south to 45 north. And uh, I've put in isolines of density, but basically you see elevated values here in the south and you see some elevated values up here in the north as we come out of the UK. And there are subsurface populations of coccolis down here at 150 meters. These are not E. huxleyi. These are things that are called Florospheria, and there are other species that live in very different environments, way down deep, uh, as opposed to these guys here, which actually look like they're almost being subducted uh, down into in, in the... Uh, Subantarctic mode water. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, th that's a that's an artifact of how we count them. So when we see in the microscope the birefringence count, we see uh, a round blob of coccolis. We can't say technically if that's a an aggregate of coccolis or a cell. So I I, I put that up there as just to be more careful about um, in the bio, with the birefringence technique, uh, that's, the, that's the one drawback. You could have a bunch of aggregated coccolis, detached coccolis, that would look like a cell. On the, on the, filter. On the filter. Yes. Uh, 
Oh, so, <coughs> yeah, right. Um, it's a, that's a hard one to answer in that how we're preparing the samples, which is we take a Niskin sample, we filter it on an HA filter, and so by the time you go from the suspended sample down on, onto a filter where all the stuff is being accumulated, um, I'd be a little bit wary about what I call a natural aggregate as opposed to a, a, an aggregate which is artif an artifact of how we, we count them. Uh, yeah. <coughs> yeah. Yeah, and, and so, so check out the concentrations here. So they go up to 200 cells per mill for e uh, a coccolithophore cells and aggregates at the peak. And in the middle of the gyres, here's the sub South Atlantic gyre right here, we're in the green zone. That's about 80 of these per mill. Um, and in, in the equatorial region here, the cells and aggregates are actually quite low. They're down to 40, but we, we still see them. Um, the coccolis, I'm sorry, yeah, you. Another question, I mean, the, whatever aggregates you have are likely not necessarily to have the same size as a cell. Right. Well, that's that's the problem. Yeah. 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 Yeah.
but we find very low values. It's possible the calcium carbonate is dissolving down there. I'm going to... Okay, the last thing I'm going to talk about is this great calcite belt. And that's this region down here in the south. Ever since we started looking at it from space, um, uh, we've been fascinated by it and the potential causes for it. And uh, so if you're in that feature and you drop a radiometer, this is what it looks like. Uh, it, this is in the most concentrated sections. Uh, basically, you can't see the radiometer at, at one and a half meters depth. Um, and we've done some cruises down there looking at the distribution. Uh, are there really coccoliths there? Here's in the Patagonian Shelf, you can see. And here is further to the east, still there, mixed with diatoms. Some diatoms, still you see the E. Huxleyi. And here, going into the Indian sector, that's uh, Africa over here. Uh, north of the subtropical front, these are called umbilosphera. Here you get down by Crozet Island, lots of coccolithophorids. Over here as we, uh, as we head to the east, this is a very low mag scanning electron microscope shot. That's a 10 micron scale bar. And these are giant diatoms. And if you zoom in on those giant <coughs> diatoms, you'll see coccolis interspersed. And here's some more giant diatoms south of Kerguelen. And then you zoom in, there's a giant diatom right there, and you see coccolis. So it's this very interesting community of giant diatoms and coccolithophorids. Further south still, you can see E. huxleyi. South of the polar front, we can't find any coccolis. It's in agreement with McIntyre and Bay for the Atlantic sector. We could not find a one. Going back north again, you can see uh, the e, e. huxleyi coccolis again. And now we're starting to see, this is called Rhabdosphera over here. This is called um, uh, uh, Chalcidiscus leptoporus, a uh, big giant thing. And then over here, uh, Chalcisolenia, really weird shaped, that's a coccolithophorid. You see the uh, rhombohedral crystals here, which is associated with calcium carbonate. Uh, and there's an umbilosphera there. And there are different species. The diversity increases as you go uh, towards the east. Now even, you know, the biogeochemists, they, they uh, uh, were interested in this because here is the climatology. The image is the climatology for PIC. And here's our cruise track along here. And we were measuring PCO2. Remember way back to the beginning of the talk, I was telling you about the stoichiometry where where they calcify, PCO2 goes up, and should go up, and where there's no calcification, it might become a sink. So everything that is warm colored here, yellows to reds for these stations, are sources. Coming in, it's a sink, there's low CO2. You cross the climatological subtropical front, it goes up. Uh, you go down by Crozet, you see these very high values. And then as we come down across, this region here, it goes down, comes up again off of Heard Island, and then uh, there's a drop here, which is, this is the only exception to the rule, and down here, uh, this is, you know, this is a 12-year climatology, 14-year climatology, and down here we see c low CO2. The point being, in these regions with high calcite, we are seeing PC a PCO2 source, which in, normally in the Southern Ocean, it's a PCO2 sink. Uh, and it followed roughly the patterns shown by the climatology. And last thing, um, this, these are means of PIC based on one degree squares going across. Uh, and this is PIC concentration on this scale here. And that's the swath of the great belt that we were looking at. And then we were just interested in the relative concentration of PIC in each of these squares relative to the land masses. And so, Patagonian Shelf is high. There's a little shoulder here around South Georgia. South Africa, it goes up. And Australia, New Zealand, and we think this is probably iron dust which is coming in and encouraging the growth uh, of coccolithophores associated with these, uh, these dust plumes. So, climate change effects 
Uh, there are things, the ocean acidification is happening. More acidic water, it's harder to calcify. The first waters to be subsaturating will be in the high latitudes, so these northern and southern latitude regions. Um, Coccolithophores are favored by warming, but if warming is advancing north, you might expect them to be moving north, but there's going to be more uh, acidification in the high latitudes. So they're kind of stuck between a rock and a hard place as climate change happens. It's warming up the poles. It's encouraging them to move north. But these are also the regions where, where saturation is, is decreasing due to acidification. And remember I said, uh, mentioned phenology. This is the only phenology I'm going to show. But uh, Hopkins et al. has a nice paper looking at global phenology of coccolithophores. Um, and here's integrated, this is integrating all the calcium carbonate on the globe. And we're integrating this to depth. And I, ask me afterwards if you want me to tell you how we integrate it to depth. But this is in moles of PIC, and that's times 10 to the 11, 6 times 10 to the 11. Uh, and this is time for uh, the uh, modus aqua mission. And you see global PIC is basically going up and down, kind of like a heartbeat, my heart beating. Um, and the highs each year are associated with essentially the austral summer. This is the great calcite belt, which is giving these peaks. And it's varying. Some years it's greater than in others. Um, and if you look at the equinox here, this is the uh, March equinox here is actually the global low for PO, PIC. So if you're looking at how much CO2 is being produced by the calcifiers, you know, this might be a way to look at that. Um, the northern hemisphere summer, these are all northern hemisphere summer, that's this little bump here in the global PIC. And, and then the equinox, uh, the September equinox, uh, is where we're zipping back up to the next high. So the globally, calcium carbonate in the ocean is going through these very asymmetric cycles, uh, which, is which is dominated by the great calcite bill. So summary of the optical properties, the absorption of the calcium carbonate is minimal, scattering is high, it's first order contributor to water leaving radiance, scattering cross sections are variable, and they're likely species dependent. Birefringence is strong, but beware of non-calcite birefringent particles. Mesoscale high reflectance blooms are immense and are found mostly at high latitudes. Why sh you should care. Um, they can act as the primary ballast material for driving the biological pump. And this pump has removed half of the anthropogenic CO2 that we humans have produced. On shorter time scales, they can actually be a CO2 source. So beware. There, there's, this may seem like a contradiction. Uh, on short time scales, a bloom may produce CO2. But on long time scale, all that calcium carbonate is moving bicarbonate from the surface waters down to the depths uh, in the form of calcium carbonate where it redissolves. So, so it's a sink for long geological scale. A um, little more about why you should care. It affects the ocean albedo. So warming rates in coccolithophore blooms have been observed to go up by, uh, this is Steve Alkelson's work, uh, six hundredth of a degree per day inside a bloom. But over a two-week bloom, that actually amounts to something. Uh, warming and stratification will likely enhance coccolithophore growth with climate change. And they may be sensitive to ocean acidity, which in the changing Arctic may limit their advance poleward. Um, remote sensing. The record isn't long enough yet to see any trend in, in the abundance of coccolithophores. And the continued satellite color remote sensing will be the best way, I think, to follow the fate of these plants through time as the planet warms. And that's it. This is a time, this is a time series of aqua uh, for, the, uh, for PIC, and you can see these features down here. So that's it. I'll take questions. <laughs> Kurt? Yeah, I'm a little confused on something. Is the first, you 
said that I thought that coca lithophores were only a couple of two and a half million years old in the evolutionary record, but then you mm. said no. that of all sediments are right. They're, they're, they've gone through mass extinctions, and then there have been, uh, you know, these bottlenecks in evolution. So they've been around for a long, they, they go back to pre-Cretaceous, but the Cretaceous boundary, they uh, mostly disappeared, and then they repopulated, and then they, they had another bottleneck later, and which constrained them to something like eight species from which all the current day species exist. So, so it, it's, a, it's, a, it's a good question. It's just it, these bottlenecks basically eliminated uh, many of the early species which are producing those sediments. Okay. Yeah. Yeah, all right. So, um, you, you know, like, like the white tips of Dover are Yes. And, and there are some 4Ms in there too. Yeah. I hate to say that. Yeah. 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 Um, how about some of the major formations of the world that are basically coccolis, like the Red Wall limestone and the Grand Canyon? Are there, are there any particular other places like the White Cliffs of Dover where you could say, you know, this whole thing is a pile of coccolis? Um, so there are, there are other calcium carbonate formations that are not coccolis, like stromatolite formations, so ba calcifying bacteria. So, and, and some of those can be pretty significant. Um, the White Cliffs of Dover is probably the best known, and, and it, as I said, it's, it's not just coccolis there, and, and Aldous Huxley, uh, when he was writing his lectures on evolution, you know, Darwin's bulldog, he was uh, talking about the other organisms that were preserved in this reign of coccolis, and he was able to put a time scale on it because of the depth in the in the feature, and and he talked about this steady reign of nanofossils which were preserving bigger things like foraminifera or even fish skeletons. Um, so the White Cliffs of Dover, it, it, and that is, you know, that whole section of Europe is built on this. I'm sure Jason will tell you. I mean, carbonate sediments all over southern England. Um, it's, it, it goes way further than just those cliffs. Um, I don't know if I answered your question. <laughs> Though that's the best known feature. Yeah. Oh, right, right. Well, um, so, I'm sorry, so the warming part, so how, how does... You, the last thing you showed, the warming, copper is responsible for warming the upper layer. Oh, oh, for, yeah. So, uh, Steve's, I think what Steve was arguing there was that by uh, expanding the path length with all the multiple scattering, that there was more water absorption happening in that surface layer with the increased uh, uh, residence time or path of, of the photons going through it. I don't think it, he was, I mean, that, that's indirectly related to the coccolis, but I think that was more the water absorption due to increased path length. Maybe the abs, uh, yeah. Um, yeah, well, the absorption, the, the absorption of the coccolis themselves in the visible, um, the only place we could see any absorption, you know, I mean, even in the infrared part of that spectrum early on, they were identical. It was only in the UV part, which uh, we attributed maybe to organics, uh, organic coatings on the coccolis. Mm. Yeah. Mm. I didn't include K, K on there. Uh, Mary Jane. I've heard people speculate about the potential evolution in terms of the evolution of coccolis and how they 
versus the oxygenation, the backward reaction. Do you know if anybody's really looked at the risk of that? No, people have looked uh, uh, with carbonic anhydrase for the ability. So some people thought maybe, um, what's her name? Uh, Gomez? Anyhow, there was a, a, a thought that calcification might be used to break, uh, uh, to, to convert bicarbonate to CO2 that they could then use in photosynthesis. And, and so by having, if they didn't have carbonic anhydrase, they'd use calcification as a method to produce the CO2 that they need to fix. But I haven't heard much about discussion about Rubisco. For, you're talking about specifically with coccolithophores. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Oh, that's interesting. Do, do you know who? Yeah, huh. Um. Mm. <laughs> Students first. <laughs> Yeah, or at least that we can find. Yeah, that's a that's a that's a that's a million dollar question. So I think it's glacial flour. So you know these mile high glaciers that are grinding across Antarctica um, produce glacial flour is basically is silicious for the most part, but it's very fine particles. And if you've ever been like around South Georgia, there are glaciers on South Georgia, and you'll see what look like, and we've been in them, uh, coccolithophore blooms, this bright turquoise water, close as you come up on South Georgia, but it's not calcium carbonate, it's, it's this glacial flower. Heidi Dearson uh, and Ray Smith did a nice paper on glacial flower coming off of Antarctica and its optical characteristics. That might be a, that is like 2002 or something like that, um, which might be a good paper to look at. But my gut is that, and, and that's one area where the PIC algorithm does not do particularly well. And I think that's because of this glacial flower. Yeah. Yes. Yes. Um, you said you got that from the cliffs of Dover. Yeah. So what, did you just go there and just scrape off? No, the no. There, there was a there, there's a company called Omya, O M Y A, and and what was the name of their product? It was called. Uh, oh, this is terrible. It was they had given this uh, this commercialized name. And uh, I still have some I put in my garden to, to get lime, you know, to keep the acidity down. Um, and this material is used as a paper whitener, and it's also used for cleaning up oils because it absorbs organics. So when you, the, you have an oil spill in your shop, you know, in your, in your garage, they would spread the stuff out, and it's so porous, it just absorbs uh, hydrocarbons. And so, and when we did these experiments, um, this is anecdotal, we, we, we didn't really publish it, but we had an AC9 going constantly, and we, re, we observed this, uh, we called it the donut hole. So where the patch was, we had dropped uh, the, the absorption in, at 412, for example, uh, due to CDOM. We, we had sucked it up <laughs> into, the, uh, into the chalk, and then we have a filter cycle on the AC9, so every two minutes it filters out all the particles. So we were looking at, at the AG, the, the 412, uh, associated with CDOM, and it, it went down in the middle of this patch, which we attribute to sort of this uh, uh, sopping up effect that the, the chalk has. Um, it's amazing stuff. Uh, yes. Right. So, so I have a. Um, I actually had taken it out of this presentation because it was too long as it was. But um, Allison Taylor, who does very precise 
uh, pulse clamping or uh, um, charge clamping of cells. So she's a, she's interested in how ions go across membranes. She has this time lapse movie of a coccolithophore producing coccolis, and and so she, uh, under a light microscope, and I can't quite jiggle the way this thing does, but the uh, you you see this the, they form in the Golgi apparatus of the cell. And it, over the course, they form about one plate every two hours. So this is time lapse over eight or 12 hours. She had to keep this thing cold and happy, which is not easy in a like, microscope light stage. But you, you see this thing uh, uh, sort of tumbling. Let, let me see if I've got it. It, it, it's, it is wild. Um, stand by just a second. Uh, and... Movies. Maybe it's down here, or maybe it's on my desktop. I've got a. I do have another movie to show you because uh, I. No, I don't have it here. Anyhow, the um, you watch these plates form in the Golgi apparatus, and then they pop out on top of the membrane. And it, they float on this lipid membrane, and then you see the next plate immediately start to form, and 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 as it's calcifying, and then boop, it plops up onto the top, and then by the end of a couple hours, the coccolis are completely surrounding the cell, and and those of course are coming from inside the cell where there are lots of organics, so any of that calcium carbonate would have absorbed, presumably absorbed organics on its inside the cell. Now I was going to bring our container uh, for the, that we use for our time series across the Gulf of Maine called NATS. Um, it's a mobile laboratory and uh, uh, the, unfortunately I couldn't bring the truck. There's some issues we're resolving with the truck before our next trip. So uh, I, I thought I'd try to do it next best and, and I'll sh I'm going to show a, we, we made a movie for the, uh, let me blow this up and then you don't need to watch all the, uh, uh, we say what's sampled. Yeah, so these are the old days uh, and you're going to see me with a little less gray hair. Um, but we have a container that goes on the back of a, of a flatbed truck and, and that uh, basically is our mobile lab uh, and it's outfitted with all sorts of optical gear and basically we look for a clear sky day. We were out just last week uh, and, and then we drive on to the ferry and these days it was the Scotia Prince. Now it's the Nova Star and we also were on the high-speed cat ferry for a while. And the beauty of this is the ship time is cheap. It's a little over a thousand dollars a day for us to use this and we get we can get out there on clear sky days when we know the NASA satellites can see us. And uh, it's a pretty tight fit getting on there. And we always would park in the same spot. Uh, we have all of our electrical. We have two independent power supplies because the ship operates on different voltage than, than U.S. different cycles. So we bring water into the back of the container. Um, <laughs> we're pulling it up from the ship's sea chest uh, and inside we have a debubbler. We got to get rid of bubbles before we can do any optics and you see here the lots of little bubbles here and we spend a lot of time with a flashlight uh, looking to make sure that we've got the, the flows right so that we're not getting any bubbles. We purge air from all of our instruments uh, and here's a sexy shot of a flow gauge. I don't know. Um, and here it's a, a veritable octopus of cables. That's, a, that's an hydroscat instrument there. We're measuring backscattering into a chamber. Um, we have AC9, which is filtering and unfiltering, uh, unfiltering, raw and filtered. Um, here you see nice clear skies. We have our radiometers on the bow. We're doing a plaque measurement here. Um, and here we have a sky radiometer and a water viewing radiometer here. Here again notice the nice clear skies. It's about one in ten days are like this in, in the Gulf of Maine and, and now we're uh, adjusting the azimuthal viewing angle of, of the radiometers according to the sun's angle. 
Uh, we do this automated now. We don't do it manually. We do weather observations, looking for, are there white caps, how high are the seas, things like this. Um, we're also making some measurements of, of the sun. Um, oh, what was the name of this instrument? This is, uh, uh, this is in the symbios days. We're interested in the atmospheric optical depth, how thick the atmosphere was. Yeah, it's, it's not a microtops. It's, n no, this is another. We had a microtops for a while, uh, which we, we used, and then they replaced it with this thing. Now I'm going to stop this. Um, okay, we have a flow cam on board, which was running, and we're basically each sample, we're looking at what the phytoplankton community looks like. We later go through these things and, and enumerate them and, and put them into bins of functional groups like dinoflagellates, diatoms, and the like. Um, and we even do bucket samples for productivities at 20 knots. Uh, not easy. And, um, and this has a special flap in the bottom that we can then use uh, so, so it lets in water quickly and we can we fill bottles to do productivity measurements on these surface samples. Um, and uh, we filter, we pre-filter those samples to get out large grazers because we, we can't measure productivity if we have large grazers chewing everything up over the time period. We have a moving vessel profiler, uh, which basically is this device with a fish uh, with uh, CTD, temperature, salinity, and depth. Um, as well as a fluorometer on the bow of it. And we lower it down just about a meter over the water. And then we turn over control of this thing to the guy uh, down in the container who's actually controlling the drop. And uh, there's, this thing releases a brake, it freewheels cable. And uh, freewheeling cable at these speeds is very dangerous. And there are lots of sensors and also that if something goes wrong, Hopefully the instrument catches it. Meanwhile, we are at the panic button uh, in case something goes awry up top. So here we'll set it over the water, turn over control to Bruce, and then he actually runs the cast. So we can get some vertical information as the ship is steaming along. And uh, so it's freewheeling cable at about 36 feet a second. Uh, and you'll watch the wraps of cable coming off of that spool and there's a break right there, and you see how quickly we go through wraps as this thing is dropping down. It hits 100 meters, and a break sets, and this thing comes back up to the surface, and then we recover it. Um, and the people up on the Lido deck who are watching this uh, uh, torpedo coming at them, you'll see it in a moment, uh, as we're drawing in the cable, they're saying, "Hey, well, there's a torpedo that's about to hit us. And... Uh, um, and we just bring it right up alongside the ship. We've been doing this 17 years now. Uh, and we have a nice time series. And uh, we, because we can target clear sky days, and, and NASA wants to have clear sky days for uh, their validation, um, we supply about 20% of their uh, validated pigment measurements and 13% of their radiometric measurements. So, I mean, it's, it's, uh, uh, it's a great model and a cheap model for getting us out there to make uh, measurements looking at air aspects like climate change as well as uh, validation of ocean color sensors. Now, if you think that's challenging, um, oops, let's try this again. Let's stop that. If you think that's challenging, um, this is a, only about a minute long. Uh, operating on the high-speed cat, which is doing 50 miles an hour, um, it becomes a complete other uh, problem. So this is in the channel. They're doing 20. They're going as fast here in the channel as as we'd go when we're out to sea, and and. This thing at 50 miles an hour, the wake was so big that we could see the, the pixels, one kilometer pixels, of where we were uh, in, in the MODIS imagery or SeaWiffs imagery. Uh, here we are at the, at the bow. There's not much of a wake uh, to look through. 
and uh, we'd have to hang our, put our radiometers out on the side uh, instead of on the bow. There's no access to a bow. Notice a nice clear day. Um, so this thing, this thing hauls and uh, it, it crosses, it takes an 11 hour trip on any other ship uh, and it would reduce it to five hours. And uh, to get our requisite numbers of stations, we were like short order cooks, hamburger cooks, uh, it was exhausting. So here we are packed in amongst the cars. In order for them to plane off, they'd have to put the truck way up near the bow. Uh, here are our radiometers. Uh, and uh, so we had these radiometers here and then a, a, a radiometer up forward where there's no shading by superstructure. So this ferry also left like the Scotia Prince did and, and during the interim we'd use um, uh, small research vessels to do the same line but it's a lot more expensive. There's our uh, uh, downwelling radiance sensor. What's that? No, no. Um, so, so I apologize <laughs> that I couldn't bring the truck but you get an idea, some sort of idea about uh, what we've been doing now. Uh, with this time series, so. Did you go to one of your early slides and talk to the one with the, uh, the micro? Uh, the one with the micro. Oh, okay. Yeah. Uh, is that? That's the wrong one. Hold it. Yeah, that's right. Sorry, I. No, I just to point out huh, all right. Okay, it was the micro, the birefringence. Yeah. Okay, I think um, maybe this one. Or, or were you talking about how we? Ah, uh, uh, this one. Okay. No, not Let me go back to. No, oh, I'll get it. Uh, did it, did it, did it. Oh. There. I, I think it might be this one. Let me. Maybe one of these? Here you go. Oh. Sort of like when I rotated the polarizer in between the other two polarizers, if the middle polarizer is aligned up with either the top or the bottom one, there's not going to be a change. You're going to get total extinction. It's only when they're not lined up. Mm -hmm. And so the same thing happens with these things, that if the fast axis of the fire fringes is lined up with one of either the top polarizer or the bottom polarizer, you get no change. In other words, you still get extinction. Mm -hmm. when they're off, now there are there are folks now that are using circular polarized light, and and in the in the microscopy world for paleontologists, they're all hot to trot about the circular polarization because it's uh, I guess the deal is the the orient well it, it's not not dependent on the orientation of your linear polarizers, but they. For some reason, so the, the ability to enumerate the amount of PI, to relate the PIC to the birefringence uh, is better with using circular polarized light than with linear polarized light. And I'm not sure why that would be. Um, but there are people there th out there that are interested in quantifying the amount of uh, PIC per coccolith for some weird you know ancient species uh, and so they're they're now moving towards circular polarization I'd love your insights on that yeah sure, I know one paper in the literature uh, but when I used the 
folder to look at a room of book report. Yeah. And in the space, there's a, you know, the big discussion now is the possibility that there might be a polarizer uh, sensor on the platform. Do you think that could help? Yeah, so, so on the space science definition team that I was, when I was on it, um, we had uh, uh, Robert Frouin and the other gentleman, uh, Deschamps, from, yeah, and, and we got talking about this and they said, I can tell you where there was a bloom. Let's go look at it with the, the polder. And so we, I gave them the locations, we went and looked, and they, cu they couldn't see anything, uh, which was interesting. It's it, it certainly, it was just one, one try, and maybe there are other reasons. I thought for sure, you know, when we did Chalk X, we, uh, the crew loved this, we distributed it to, to all the, the folks on the bridge uh, polarizing sunglasses because they could see the patch way better uh, with polarizing sunglasses. And, you know, of course, they're looking at an angle pretty close to the horizon, but they needed to see where that patch was when they were lining up, you know, we're towing the, the, the sea, not the seesaw, the, the uh, undulating optical, whatever we call that, um, uh, the scan fish. And we were, they were, we were towing it, trying to get, go right through to bisect this feature. And so these guys had to be able to see it from a long distance away. And with the polarizing, we never got those glasses back, but um, they, they were able to visual, you know, get a visual on it much easier. So, um, So is the atmosphere. I can't turn this damn thing up. It won't let me turn it up. There. How did I hit? No. There. Sorry. That's really rude. <laughs> I'm sorry. Thank you.